Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's program brought to you by Still Pond and Betterton United Methodist Churches. I'm Pastor Bill reminding you to check out our website, stillbetterchurch.org, for some upcoming events. You'll also find there a convenient online option for your church giving as well as our Sunday morning service times. You know, Betterton Church begins their worship time at 9 a.m. every Sunday morning. Still Pond begins there at 10.30, so won't you come and join us? This afternoon at 5 p.m. we will have our fifth and final meal and a message program for this Lenten season. Come to the Betterton Volunteer Fire Company parking lot. Tune your FM radio to hear a 30-minute broadcast featuring guest speaker Joy Boyles with special music by Ned Leverage and Michael Casey. Afterwards, drive around to the portico and pick up two specially prepared meals. This week's menu is pulled pork with mac and cheese plus a dessert. Grab one meal for yourself, grab one for your neighbor. There's plenty for everybody, so won't you come and join us? Our weekly Bible study featuring the television series The Chosen continues this Thursday night. We meet at the Betterton Volunteer Fire Company from 6.30 to 8 p.m. All are welcome to come and learn why Jesus' followers are called the Chosen. If you want to join in the study, just show up. There's plenty of room for everybody. Next week is Palm Sunday, and you will have the privilege of hearing the golden radio voice of Dick Story as he brings you the gospel message on this broadcast. And Dan Blakeney will be, delivering, will be delivering the message as well as providing music for worship in our sanctuaries next week as well. In two weeks, on Easter Sunday morning, everyone is invited to the Betterton Beach Pavilion for our annual sunrise service. Justin Bitter will be that morning speaker. We will begin the worship service at 6.30 a.m. Now this event draws quite a crowd and we look forward to seeing you there. As we begin this morning's program... Let us go to prayer. Gracious God, you have anointed us with your word, as surely as Jesus was anointed with perfume by the one who loved him. May the sweetness of your ways bless us in all the days of our lives, and may the presence of your spirit guide us as you fulfill the promise to do a new thing in our lives and in this world. And we ask this in Christ's holy name, who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today I invite you to open your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 12. Today we're going to read from verses 1 through 8. Again, it's John 12, verses 1 through 8. Now, not long before today's reading, Jesus had raised his friend Lazarus from the dead. Many people witnessed this miracle and began showing faith in Christ. To honor their friend, Martha and Mary invited Jesus to a special dinner. So let us read what happens at, at that meal. When we begin at verse 1, Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. And then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus replied, Leave her alone. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. From the lyrics of F. Bland Tucker, let us pray. Lord, you have made all for your pleasure and given us food for all our days. 
giving in Christ the bread eternal. Yours is the power, be yours the praise. Amen. A couple of days before his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, Jesus enjoys a nice evening meal with his dear friends. His disciples are also there. That means there are at least 16 people attending this dinner. And this is quite an ordeal for Martha, the hostess. But Martha, I believe she's up to the task. You know, earlier in his ministry, Jesus had stopped and eaten at this home before. And according to the Gospel of Luke, at that dinner, Mary was just sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to his teaching. And Martha complained that her sister should be helping her prepare the meal for everyone. And Jesus responded to her saying, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed. As a matter of fact, only one is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. The meaning behind this teaching is that without Jesus, we can do nothing. In that light, our service to honor Jesus is important, but it is only completed by receiving Christ's strength and his guidance. We depend upon him to be able to carry out any task that honors him. And Mary chose to worship him first, to receive the strength and wisdom before doing anything else. Now this time around, Martha is not complaining about her little sister. She is simply being the humble, obedient servant that is her God-given nature. Jesus teaches us later in this chapter that whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servants will also be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Martha has recently witnessed her brother Lazarus being brought back to life by Jesus. And to honor Christ, she does what she does best. She serves him and his friends a meal. This is her form of, a worship, of worshiping Emmanuel, of God with us. And I'll tell you what, folks, this world needs a lot of Marthas. We really do. But regarding her sister Mary... In this story, we see that she is once again at Jesus' feet. And this time, however, she is not listening to his teaching. She is in full worship of the one who brought her brother back to life. You know, in that culture, in that time, a Jewish dinner table was low to the floor and did not include chairs. When you sat down for dinner, you actually reclined sideways, leaning on your left side and eating with your right hand. While in this position, your legs were curled behind you. Now, this is where Mary takes the opportunity to anoint Jesus' feet with extravagant perfume. Oxnard is a fragrant plant, and the extracted oil was very expensive. In today's story, we hear that Mary poured nearly a pint of this cologne on Christ's feet. And the fragrance filled the entire house. Now, where Martha had sacrificed her time and talent to serve Jesus, Mary chose to give him the very best thing she had, too. A whole bottle of cologne that was worth a year's wages to the average Jew. Now, to put things in perspective, in today's market, a bottle of Chanel No. 5 Grand Extract cost $4,200 per ounce. If someone were to buy a pint of this fragrance, it would cost them $67,200, which is about the median income of an average American household. Now, take that pint of Chanel No. 5 and pour it all over the feet of your Savior. Could you honestly do that? Or would you possibly think that Jesus could get by with just a couple of ounces? You know, in our human economy of life, we might figure that pouring out the whole bottle would be, would be wasteful. But we must be careful when we try to put a price tag on our worship of Christ. You know, in today's passage, we read that Judas Iscariot questioned Mary's extravagance. And though we might agree with his argument that the money raised from selling a perfume would help the poor, we must remember that Judas was a thief and that his intentions were self-motivated. Now, we need to recognize that Jesus is worth everything that we have, everything that we are, and even more. 
we must understand the true meaning of sacrifice. And then we should be willing to make the offering to our, to our Savior. But what does that look like to us? What does a true sacrifice look like to us? You know, pastor and author Stu Weber gives us a good example. Stu has three sons, and his youngest always seemed to live in the shadows of his two older brothers. One of the older brothers was all conference in one sport. The other was all conference in yet another sport. Ryan, his youngest son, was just as high-powered as his brothers, but he lacked the popular achievements of his older siblings. Now, to encourage his youngest son, Stu spent a lot of time with him outdoors, you know, hunting, fishing, camping. Anyone who has spent time in the outdoors knows that a pocket knife is essential gear. And the man with the best blade gets the job done. If you're setting up camp, you need a sharp pocket knife. And Ryan had a pocket knife that revealed his importance. You see, his older brothers always had to ask to use his knife when camping. It was always sharp, ready for any task. And the knife had given Ryan status within the tribe. He was the man with the blade. And it had become his identity. One year, the family was planning a birthday party for Stu, for the dad, and everyone had wrapped presents for the evening celebration, but Ryan went into his father's office earlier in the afternoon, waiting patiently for his dad to notice him. And when Stu finally looked up from his studies, Ryan came forward to give him his birthday present. He didn't want to wait until the party. He wanted the meaning behind the gift to be a special remembrance. Why? Because Ryan's gift to his dad was his most prized possession. It was the thing that gave him his identity. It was his pocket knife. The boy with the blade was willing to sacrifice who he was just to please his father. And this is what the aroma of grace smells like. And yet it's still unmatched by the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. You know, in Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2, Paul teaches us to follow God's example, therefore, as dearly beloved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice unto God. The service of Martha filled the hungry bellies of all those who came to dinner. And the fragrance of Mary's expensive perfume filled the entire house when she poured it on Jesus' feet. And afterwards, she wiped his feet with her hair. Now, these examples of sacrifice are preambles to what Christ does in six days. When Jesus and his disciples gather for the Passover feast, Christ is supposed to be the honored guest. He's the rabbi. The leader, the one who sits at the head of the table. And yet, the Lord steps, steps away from his position to assume the duties of a servant. He washes the feet of his disciples, each and every one of them, even the feet of G Judas, who will betray him later that night. You know, in this event, he's not only being Martha, the servant, he's also being Mary, the one who wipes their feet but nothing compares with the greatest sacrifice that he makes the following day. Jesus, the Son of Man who knew no sin, the Son of God who bore our shame, spares our sinful lives by taking the sins of the world upon himself. On the cross, he became the ultimate aroma of grace. A fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God, our Father in heaven. And he did it out of pure love. Pardon me for that interruption. Friends, we are called to take on the nature of Martha and Mary with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We should be willing to serve one another, even when it seems too overwhelming. And we should be willing to sacrifice all that we have, all that we are, to those who are in desperate need, even if it seems too extravagant. When we respond to the Holy Spirit's direction, we become the fragrant aroma of God's grace that will fill other people's hearts, which, by the way, is the home of God here on earth. Isn't it time 
to trade in the hateful odor of sin for that pleasing fragrance of Jesus Christ? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you with the stench of sin upon us. But thanks be to your Son, Jesus, we can become the aroma of your saving grace. Lord, as we follow Christ and by your Holy Spirit, show us how to be the pleasing fragrance of sacrifice to one another. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today's closing thought. I've been writing a letter to an old friend of mine uh, these past three weeks. He's been suffering from cancer for some time now, and I was told that the malignancy was beginning to spread. The family was holding a little hope that he would recover. Now, my letter is filled with stories of when we were younger, of the many things we had done together before marriage and family took a hold of our lives. My friend had made a significant impact in my development as a young man. Whether he knew it or not, he taught me teamwork. He gave me confidence when facing my fears. He showed me how to be hospitable to folks. And he witnessed to me about finding joy in life's little things. Now, I had completed my letter to him yesterday morning. But before I could give it to him, he was taken to Johns Hopkins Hospital. His health had taken a turn for the worst. The cancer will soon take him from his family, his friends, and from this world. I can't imagine what life will look like without him. My point is that life does turn on a dime. And it usually le leaves little change. I regret not getting this letter completed when I had more time. Or better yet, when we had more time to hear what he really means to me. D. L. Moody once said in his sermon entitled Martha and Mary, Wouldn't it be well to give some of our bouquets before a man dies and not go and load down his coffin? He can't enjoy them then. And what I believe Reverend Moody was trying to say is that we should tell our friends and loved ones that we that they really mean to us what they really mean to us before there, there's no time to do so. We should tell them that we love them and that we forgive them, and that we want to be forgiven as well. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth once saying, We are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Friends, we all have done things that we wished we hadn't done. But some of our biggest regrets are found in the things that we didn't do especially when given the opportunity. I beg of you, tell a family member that you love them. Tell a friend that you forgive them. Ask for forgiveness from those whom you have harmed and who you have sinned against. And do this today. You'll find that the fragrant aroma of God's grace through Christ Jesus cancels the pungent smell of pride, sin, and regret every time. We hope you can join us for worship in our sanctuaries real soon. But if you can't, that's okay. You can always tune in next Sunday morning at 8 a.m. for another broadcast. And until then, go in peace. And may the peace of God go with you. Amen. <laughs>